So uh, my job here tonight is to uh, introduce uh, the theme of the, of the symposium, to talk a little bit about that. Um, this idea, global movement assemblages, what do we mean by this term? And what is there to talk about for two days about this term? Well, first to say that um, our starting point for this discussion is um, an astonishing series of popular uprisings that began in December of 2010 uh, and continued with great intensity throughout 2011 and more episodically since then. And of course, I'm referring to, number one, the events that we now know as the Arab Spring, uh, the Tunisian Revolution, the Egyptian Revolution, the uh, violent uprising and um, civil war in, in Libya, the ongoing uh, horrendous war in Syria, um, the uprisings in Yemen, in Bahrain, across the whole region. Uh, this as astonishing series of uh, hundreds of thousands of people occupying squares and demanding an end to the regime. This was followed in short order by similar kinds of gatherings, again, of tens of thousands of people in Spain in May of 2011, protesting the onset of austerity strategies in the wake of the uh, financial crisis. And across southern Europe, these kinds of occupations happened, again, in big public squares, orchestrated through social media, protesting austerity agendas, and explicitly inspired by the events of the Arab Spring. And then in September 2011, in response to a call from ad busters, Occupy Wall Street took place uh, in New York City and then quickly uh, multiplied across North America. So it was an extraordinary year, such that even Time Magazine noticed and called 2011 the year of the activist. And since then, there have been uprisings in Ukraine, uh, the Gezi Park movement throughout Turkey, the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong, and other kinds of movements that have also resonated and, and um, taken shape in similar kinds of ways. Student uprisings in Chile and in Quebec over tuition fees, and other kinds of um, democratic uprisings. As usual, no one saw these coming. As usual, scholars like me are scrambling to understand these events. For us who are gathered here, uh, who are sympathetic uh, to many of the currents of these movements, to their calls for freedom, for dignity, and for social justice, it also becomes a question about how our modes of analysis, how our ways of reading these movements which help constitute these movements, how our modes of analysis help uh, these movements into being, uh, expand their meaning, uh, or shut down their meanings. So that's really our task here, is to think about this in a hard way. Uh, many scholarly observers uh, who have sought to explain uh, these movements. Um, of course, there are, many scholars are perturbed that they cannot predict these things, but then they set out to explain these things. And of course, people have noticed that you know, there's been a close temporal relationship, that these movements happened very closely, one on top of the other, uh, in, concentrated, uh, in a concentrated time period. But then they also had this incredible spread across global space. And so people and scholars have set out to try to discern their roots and their structural origins. And they have theorized a global wave of contention or a cycle of protest. And they have noted that these, many of these movements share uh, common characteristics or common features. And key among them, 
are their use of new digital communication technologies in the consolidation of these movements, the sustained mass occupation of public space, their urban quality, the fact that they are heavily peopled by unemployed or underemployed, uh, perhaps overeducated youth, and uh, that they have employed secular, liberal, political grammar of democracy and social rights. These are the kinds of features that theorists who are looking for global connections are pointing to, to posit some kind of relationship across this incredible, diverse array uh, of movement uprisings in this uh, very short time period. Scholars also note uh, the global conjuncture. They note the timing of the 2008 financial crisis. They posit uh, the imposition of austerity members, uh, uh, measures in different contexts as prompting these movements. And they point to the deepening and twin crises of both neoliberalism and of representative democracy. Now that's all fine. Within that kind of uh, reading of this global assemblage, I would say that there are three broadly, uh, they're overlapping, but three broad kind of lines of interpretation. One is a kind of line that posits that these movements reflect liberal modernization. In other words, they reflect the globalization, globalization as modernization of the spread of institutions of the modern state, of civil societies, and that this is a fourth wave of democratization. A second dominant tradition of interpretation is Marxian inspired. And it talks about neoliberal capitalism around mounting uh, dispossession and about calls for economic justice and sees these movements of 2011 in the lineage of uh, the global left. So the revolutions of 1848 in Europe, the world revolution of 1968, and more recently the global justice movement. And so they see it within that trajectory of uh, the global left. A third uh, dominant tradition of reading we could call the techno-utopians. And this, of course, uh, leading, leading among them is the work uh, of Manuel Castells, who basically posits that, um, that these movements are really the product of uh, new information technologies, that they are a product of the internet as an autonomous space in which individuals find each other and uh, move from outrage to hope and then gather in public squares and uh, demand the, uh, the downfall of the regime. Uh, and in, in, in many ways, that reading is, is a, a gloss on the others. It's a form of, it's a theorization, really, of the globalization of modernity. Now, these are the available ways of understanding the connections among these uh, astonishing events of 2011. And there's no doubt uh, about the significance of those events. The problem is, and this is part of the problem that's animating our symposium, is that these readings of the global wave of contention, which arise from Western social science, basically are underpinned by an assumption of the globalization of Eurocentric modernity. And this has enormous consequences for their conception of what is a social movement, for their understanding of what is political, and for who they privilege as political subjects. Sometimes they, they have come now to see, in the wake of the Arab Spring especially, social movements in the non-West, 
but they see them in their similarity to movements as they have unfolded in the West. They see actors that are in keeping with actors that have appeared in the West. They see ways of being political that are familiar. And so this uh, presents a question to us about the adequacy of these ways of understanding this global assemblage and the relations between these movements and their possible meaning. And so this provoked us to organize this uh, symposium. And to this we're bringing, um, we're proposing two traditions of thought to try to stir the pot. One of these is um, a loose grouping of uh, scholarship that's known as assemblage thinking. And the notion of assemblage uh, originates with the Deleuze and Qatari. And to put it very, very simply, the notion of assemblage pushes us to ask again, what is this thing, X movement, that we want to understand? So I'm just going to use the example of Occupy because it's the movement uh, of this assemblage that many of us are familiar with and has arisen in uh, North American space, Turtle Island space. I'll come to the Turtle Island part in a minute. Um, what does this thing occupy that we want to understand? Assemblage thinking pushes us to disaggregate it and to see its heterogeneity anew, number one. And secondly, to ask not only about its human elements, but its non-human elements, and how these have come together in an assemblage. Now, just to give you an example of what I think this can do for us. In the context of the proliferation of Occupy across North America, indigenous activists were present in many of the Occupy encampments. And they were present from the beginning, and they were present as part of Occupy, expressing support for Occupy, as in fact constituting Occupy. But also from the first moment of their presence there, they were radically unsettling Occupy. Because those indigenous activists who recognized in Occupy something important, something valuable, something with which they had some affinity, at the same time were saying, what is this language of Occupy when you're occupying indigenous land? What does it mean that you are occupying when you are occupying indigenous land? So the indigenous critique of Occupy, which let me just say in the globalist readings of the meaning of Occupy, never appear. They're really invisible, or they're erased as part of Occupy, as part of the Occupy assemblage. That the indigenous critique of Occupy places in the Occupy assemblage the question of land, the question of history, the question of memory, of indigenous people's history, of indigenous people's memory, of a memory of colonial violence, of dispossession, and also of the reality of indigenous people's survival, their presence, their resurgence, and their being part of Occupy. The indigenous questioning of Occupy, when it's readmitted into the assemblage of Occupy, forces us to rethink what we think is Occupy. It forces us to rethink what does it mean to talk about the 99% versus the 1%? Who exactly is the 99% and who is the 1%? What does it mean to talk by, about the democracy of Occupy in light of the, or through the indigenous critique? What does the indigenous critique of Occupy, how does it re make us rethink the practices of the general assemblies of Occupy, which were so celebrated? 
as an example of direct and participatory democracy, as a critique of representative democracy? How does it make it, us rethink Occupy's valorization of consensus as a new form of politics, as an alternative form of democracy? How does it unsettle Occupy's race-blind and gender-blind understandings of equality and inclusion? How does it make us think about Occupy's democracy as part and parcel of a settler colonial project? This is an example, I think, of how assemblage thinking by remixing what we think is Occupy forces us to rethink what is Occupy. And in rethinking something like Occupy, we can also rethink what its relationship is to these other movements that appear to be so similar to it. If we rethink and unsettle Occupy in this way, Perhaps we can rethink and unsettle the global movement assemblage in some important ways. How would centering the indigenous critique of Occupy help us rethink the global movement assemblage? If we thought about um, the global movement assemblage by centering the extraordinary participation of women and we made that a central feature of what is extraordinary about these events, how would it re help us rethink the meaning of these events? If we at the same time thought about the incidents of violence against women at the heart of these emancipatory movements, how would that force us to rethink the meaning of the global movement assemblage? The violence against women in Tahrir Square, the violence against women in Zuccotti Park. So in closing, we want to reassemble these movements. We want to reassemble the movements of the post-2010 period. We want to reassemble them via a decolonial critique of Eurocentric knowledge regimes, which have so shaped how we see these movements. And we want to ask what their relationship is to longer standing movements for social transformation, especially to indigenous resurgence and to movements for gender justice. Um, so in closing, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our guests in the symposium. We are looking forward to a wonderful few days. Um, I still have a great deal to learn uh, about assemblage thinking since I only relatively recently began to see it as a promising analytic uh, for rethinking and reimagining activism, uh, participation, and protest, particularly in the 2010s or since the 2010s. So what I'm going to do is do my best to do justice to our specific charge for this session addressing two core problematics of the symposium, as well as touching on some of the questions posed in the concept paper that Janet and her co-authors prepared for this event. I, too, have a prepared text, and in the interest of time, I'm going to read more than I like to, but I'll move in and out of the text as much as I can without running too far over time. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is first um, talk to you all about the alternative conceptual framework, discursive fields of action, which I deploy to rethink social movements, or as I prefer to say, uh, rethink activism, participation, and protest, kind of breaking down the notion of social movements as a unified whole by uh, breaking it down into those three things in the late 20th and uh, first decades of the 21st century. Second. As per our assignment for this opening session, I'll explore the utility of assemblage thinking for studying transnational, translocal social movements, specifically the post-2010 um, ensemble. And I'll suggest that because social movements are not totalities, much less pre-given or static ones, 
Assemblage thinking helps us better apprehend how, when, and why their parts, components, elements, actants come together and move apart, assemble, and reassemble without undoing the assemblage. Whereas uh, it's usually thought that the withdrawal of a set of parts um, is, is, is said to compromise or even end a social movement. Third, I'll try to explore the similarities and differences between uh, the post-2010 assemblage and other pre-existing transnational social movement ensembles, uh, particularly transnational feminisms in my case. Uh, here I'll suggest that global, act, global act, that, I'm sorry, that the global and activism participation in protest today is more part of um, the, radic the radical imagination as Alex Kaznabish puts it in his paper for this workshop than it is a set of ongoing networked practices. Drawing in the experiences of post-2010 um, feminist activists in Brazil, I will also propose that translocal assemblages may be more characteristic of today's feminist and other types of activism, especially if compared with the feminist activisms typical in or of the heyday of anti-globalization, which were more often formally organized and transnationally, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, formally linked and, and, and organized transnationally and were connected to what Lynn Phillips and Sally Cole referred to as distinctive feminist flows that emerged from two translations of feminism that emerged in the late neoliberal era, the, what they call the UN orbit and the Another World um, translation. Each was deep, deeply, as these terms uh, imply, each was deeply intertwined with the UN World Summits and the World Social Forum process, respectively. Though today's translocal feminist assemblages also cross national borders in many cases, they are typically not transnational in the linked or network sense that these late 20th century fields were. I will offer examples from Brazil's Slutwalk, anarcho-autonomous feminist organizing, and recent organizing among Afro-descendant women to illustrate the translocality of contemporary globally-minded feminisms. Um, so first a few words, can you read that? Yeah, first a few words about my alternative conceptualization that I'm gonna do very much in brief here of the notion of um, social movement or my rethinking of that notion. The political grammar I've been working with for some time now in analyzing the shifting dynamics of what we normally call social movements, feminist movements in particular, largely turns on this notion of discursive fields of action. It actually, by the way, for those of you who know Bourdieu and theories of fields and so on and so forth, um, much of my thinking on fields is derived not from that tradition, uh, but from Brazilian intellectual activists who began to develop this notion way back in the 1980s. I'd never even uh, read Bourdieu, actually, when I first started using the term fields to think about movements. Discursive fields of action are much more than a mere agglomeration of what sociologists call SMOs or social movement organizations. They encompass a wide variety of individual and collective actors and of cultural and political sites and, na and, and local, national, translocal, and global scales. Discursive fields of action are both formally and informally articulated through reticulate webs. Uh, these not only connect social movement organizations and NGOs, but also interconnect individuals and more or less formalized groupings situated in diverse spaces and places, whether in civil society, in uncivic society, um, which is most often politically articulated in the streets and in the countryside, which I like to call civil society's other, political society, the state, intergovernmental organizations, the academy, cultural industries, the mainstream media, alternative media, these are all sites in which activism happens. Um, and we need to map that activism as it happens outside that sphere that we normally think of as the sphere of social movements and civil society. Um, that's harder to read. Activist fields, are, I just put this together in the hotel room like a while before we came, so I didn't get to play with it much. Activist fields are wo woven together through multi-level, multi-layered, and continuous crossings of people's practices and ideas, virtual and real. Because of this, feminist fields are always in movement. The boundaries of who or what is properly a feminist are imposed and constantly policed by actors who establish themselves as hegemonic in a given moment or context. But they are also constantly challenged 
and reshaped through political struggle, contestation, translation, and reappropriation. Fields are also articulated discursively, that is, through shared, though continuously contested languages, meanings, and worldviews. This idea of worldviews will come back as an important feature of these things. Uh, indeed, political and discursive contestation and the contestation, contention and the contestation of meanings and power are constitutive elements of feminist fields. My most recent reemersion in the fields of feminism in Brazil during a long sabbatical um, in 2013-2014 triggered a further conceptual realignment in my thinking about this stuff. Recent developments in Afro-Brazilian feminist politics in particular prompted me to think about ontological politics or better emergent feminist fields, distinct activist fields grounded in different worlds and thus in distinctive views from those worlds. So not different views of the same world, but distinctive views from different worlds, from being positioned literally in different worlds. Um, so uh, furthermore, feminist discourses are today multiplying at a vertiginous rate, and people who call themselves feminists engage in a truly dazzling array of action. Feminisms are now arguably not only plural, but multi-sided, often translocal, and internally hyper-heterogeneous. The, boundary or, the boundaries or parameters whose incessant disputation and reconfiguration were to my mind constitutive of late 20th century feminist fields are today arguably so diffuse, so mutable, moving so swiftly so as to make it close to impossible to even dispute them political, politically and also making it all the more challenging to theorize them adequately, let alone map them or trace them empirically. And these multiple places and spaces of feminist activism combine and recombine, clash, rebound, and reassemble with others or with one another in often transmuted forms. Feminism, feminist activism then is not just rhizomatic in the sense of that it seems to be in similar ways popping up in different ways, but I think it rather looks and feels more like what many have theorized as assemblages, and I'm going to say more about that in a moment. But first I want to share with you a couple of stories about emergent feminist fields in Brazil and what I'm tentatively beginning to um, think of as, as feminist activist, translocal feminist activist assemblages. The first I'm going to talk about is um, the Marcha das Vadias, Brazil's version of the now global slut walk ensemble, um, which you're very familiar with here since it started in neighboring t Toronto. Um, the Slut Walk has mobilized tens of thousands of young women in Brazil, as well as trans feminists and solidary gay and straight young men in dozens of Brazilian cities since um, its first edition in 2011. Literally, embo li literally embodying their feminisms by emblazoning gender non-conforming, queer, anti-racist, pro-social justice, and trans-inclusive slogans on their bodies, the Vajia's rebellion, uh, rebellious public defiance of, of cultural gender norms um, brazenly enacts a radical cultural politics. Why the term Vajia's? In one rendition from the Marcha in the city of San Carlos in the interior of the state of San Paulo, a uh, woman once said, we appropriated this term slut because we realize that it is a word used to, used to address us women when we demonstrate a kind of attitude of freedom, especially sexual freedom. If, it, if, it, if being free means being a slut, then we are all sluts. We live in a world that is scandalized by strong words, but not by violence against women. Gleggiani Ferreira, a vadia from the Coletivo de Vagabundas do Desterro, and even in Brazil they use different words besides vadia, besides slut, to, in each of the local marches. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a group from the southern city of Florianópolis, which is my hometown in Brazil. Um, she explains that the use of the term itself triggered extensive debate among feminists and critics alike. She argues that much like the North American experience, which sought to extract another connotation from the term queer, the struggle for the resignification of the term vagia, commonly used in Brazil as an expression of mockery and name calling, was one of the principal objectives of the marchas. A global radical imaginary is clearly at work here. Yet though slut walk is now an activist 
a global activist modality in Brazil and as, and as in many other parts of the world, it is organized independently of other slut walks, even those in other parts of the same country. It is thus a translocal assemblage, emergent from the multiple crossings, the temporary entanglements among marchas in different Brazilian cities as activists and their mobilizational paraphernalia, um, like posters, images, chants, etc., travel and reassemble among dispersed sites. The Brazilian Marcha was enacted, has enacted cultural interventions that along with the effusive anarcha-feminist scene, the extensive feminist hip-hop crowd, the blog blogueiras feministas or feminist bloggers, the blogueiras negras or black, bl black women bloggers, the girls rock scene, Minas do Rock, and many other ludic cultural political expressions emergent in recent years signal the growing popularization of feminism among new generations of activists. Most of these activists, um, ex most of these activist expressions are articulated virtually and translocally, and like the Marcha das Vadias, also translate and reappropriate global discourses and activist practices that travel virally. Um, like the Marcha das Vadias, a wide range of other expressions of today's multi-streamed, hyper-heterogeneous feminisms are bent on undermining dominant power uh, formations through innovative cultural interventions. One uh, novel recent feminist organizing modality is the festival, a format that a group of activists who were organizing the first Antifest Suspiring Femini Feminista, which was an anti-festival um, sigh of feminism, is the, what the literal translation would be, in Belo Horizonte explained, uh, these are supposed to be more fluid, less structured than the now traditional feminist encuentros or encounters of yesterday year. It is something much less academic, they said, kind of do it yourself. It's contact with the streets, getting, getting together and doing it for ourselves. It's a feminist breath of fresh air in the midst of machista violence and life's messiness. It's an attempt to practice together feminist ways of relating to one another and to construct autonomous zones of resistance. For a flavor of their cultural political agenda, suffice it to say that the Anarcha Autonomous event featured vegan cooking, shows, debates about transfeminism, feminist activism against the prison industrial complex, discussion, uh, discussions of Afro hair and binarisms, Zion launchings, workshops on self-defense, gordophobia or fat phobia, and cuerpa, a gender queer reference to the body, FTM, uh, do-it-yourself sexual brinquedas, a queer gender reference to sex toys, and spanking, among others. The Antifest uh, was inspired by a similar fe festival, this is the one you're looking at here, uh, held yearly in Salvador Bahia between 2010 and 2013, the Festival Vuva La Vida, uh, whose third edition, I, I assume you know the, the, what that means. It's not hard, not, not a big stretch. Uh, those third, uh, this, this third, third edition slogan was proudly feminist, necessarily inconvenient. Uh, the public call for the meeting posted through social media and on their website described the event as follows. It is a feminist countercultural festival through do-it-yourself ethics. We believe that change does not depend on the initiative of political parties and institutions. We should practice it daily, developing new values for relations caught up in daily life. This implies thinking our more intimate habits, rethinking our more intimate habits, making revolution both in the streets and in bed. Politics is also fun. Still, some Afro-Brazilian feminists critique the Marcha das Vagias and other, uh, other, in their view, predominantly white majority middle class expressions of feminist cultural transgressions, such as the Festivais, for their difficulty in dealing with black women's specificity and demand that anti-racism cease to be a facile verbiage and become a quotidian practice embraced by everyone, according to one interviewee. One black feminist and organizer of the Vajias in Salvador argued that, quote, racism labels us as sluts and whores from the day we were born because of race. Historical racism seized and imprisoned us within our sexuality, and that's something that for years black women's struggles have been working to reconstruct, to deconstruct. I want to suggest that black women's movements in Brazil today should be seen in themselves to constitute an extensive discursive field of action composed of diverse strands. Um, the Black Women's March Against Racism and 
the Black Women's March Against, I have a feeling I'm behind my slides, uh, against racism, violence, and for living well is a process that advances an innovative methodology which recognizes that diversity. This was held in Brasilia in November of last year. The story I'll tell you about it is meant to illustrate the configuration of a distinctive emergent translocal Afro-Brazilian feminist field, one that, that one was sometimes discordant, yet also often recombinant parts that constitute a complex assemblage. It is inserted in and sometimes recombines with translocal assemblages like the Badias and Anarca Feminist Festivais through the territorializing and re-territorializing dynamics that configure and reconfigure Brazilian feminist politics today. Um, in, held in Brasilia on November 18, 2015, the actual march on the nation's capital, which according to varying reports, drew between five to 20,000 women and perhaps a few hundred men from across Brazil, was the culmination of an unprecedented nationwide, um, an unprecedented uh, nationwide mobilization uh, process uh, that spanned several years uh, and encompassed all regions of the country. Uh, it, considering, uh, considered a major turning point, a veritable watershed in Afro-Brazilian women's activism by organizers, participants, and observers alike, the Marcha involved every conceivable sector of Afro-descendant women's organizing and many activists from, mixed gender, uh, from the mixed gender black movement as well. Um, though many black women, how am I for time? I have no idea. Two, three minutes. I'm going to have to jump through a lot of this. Uh, the point is that the Marsha uh, was able through, um, can I, well, the Marsha was able to, um, it says that this is the part that, that's text, um, draw in, its slogan was, come and march with us. And the idea was precisely to reach out to women who were organizing uh, in every sector of Brazilian, black women who were organizing in every sector of society and bring them towards the march. And local groupings of the march that affiliated with the march did all kinds of fundraising activities and cultural activities and political activities and so on to fit, raise f money and awareness so that they could participate in the big march in Brasilia. But that process arguably was much more important than the big march in Brasilia in terms of consolidating or, or, or creating uh, an assemblage of some movement assemblage of sort of an, uh, an activist assemblage of people who don't normally interact with one another in an ongoing way. Um, you know, so you have, you had from, um, you had, you know, everything from Mais de Santo, uh, from traditional Afro, um, uh, uh, Brazilian religions, uh, to, uh, you know, radical lesbian feminist, um, anarchist, to trade unionists, to, uh, liberal professionals to former politicians or current politicians. It, you know, so this broad uh, spectrum of people who uh, seldom come together. Um, in, in, in importantly, there was also a major uh, presence, an unprecedented presence of people from the North and Northeast, which is the, the blackest and not coincidentally the poorest uh, region of Brazil. <laughs> Uh, whereas normally in these kinds of things, people from the wealthier South and Southeast sort of control the, the dynamics of the assemblage. Um, and they were organizing transnationally with other women in the Amazon, and they were the ones that brought in this idea of, of living well. So the march was called F Against racism, racism Against Violence and For Living Well. And I thought, wait a minute, this isn't Bolivia. Why are they talking about living well? Uh, and it turns out that it was from Andean women, women that had interacted with black women in the Amazon, of which there are many and, and seldom are they understood to be there, uh, that, that this kind of idea, so it's this idea of, of be, living well became for them, for the Black Women's March, a kind of civilizational pact that in itself signals uh, or provides evidence of the distinctive discourses that constitute this um, emergent Afro-Brazilian feminist field. Um, 
The marcha process as distinct from the event in Brasilia might be understood as an emergent modality of feminist activism, one that leads me to believe that assemblage thinking is a useful way of apprehending feminism in, the, in movement today. And this part is essential for sort of our theoretical considerations. Uh, the marcha brought together rearranged local and national fields of Afro-Brazilian women's activism. The Afro-Brazilian sex workers, black domestic workers, and Afro-descendant trade unionists who came together during the march don't necessarily engage one another discursively in an ongoing way, either virtual or real. But they nonetheless combine and recombine, assemble and reassemble in diverse activist fora like those emergent through the marcha process. Assemblage, as Colin McFarland points out, um, it, I'm sorry, it's Colin, um, uh, Colin McFarland notes, points to dispersion and transformation, processes all often overlooked in network accounts. The notion emphasizes gathering, coherence, and dispersion, he says, drawing attention to the work of assembling and reassembling social material practices that are diffuse, tangled, and contingent. It shifts our analytical gaze towards, quote, spatiality and temporality, elements that are drawn together at a particular conjuncture only to disperse or realign. As Martin Mueller suggests, we can think of assemblages as a mode of ordering heterogeneous entities so that they work together for a certain time. Jeff Juris here makes a useful distinction between, that many of you are no doubt familiar with, between the logic of networking a cultural framework that helps uh, give rise to practices of communication and coordination across diversity and differences on the part of collective actors, and a logic of aggregation, which involves the assembling of masses of individuals from diverse backgrounds with, within physical spaces. Whereas the use, uh, the listservs and websites he goes on in movements for global, in the movements for global justice during the 1990s and 2000s, helped to generate and diffuse distributed network lodges. He arg logics, he argues, in the Occupy movements, social media have contributed to powerful logics of aggregation, which have committed to to have. I'm sorry, which have continued to exist alongside rather than entirely displacing network logics. I'm I'm just trying to rattle through this. So I'm sorry if I'm bumbling a bit. Anyway, jurists, like jurists, I want to conclude by suggesting that activist fields and assemblages exist along one an alongside rather uh, alongside one another rather than entirely displacing one another. The existence of assemblages does not imply a new era of collective action in which discursive fields of action have disappeared. Rather, assemblages can and do sediment into activist fields, and fields can and do melt into assemblages, if you will. The same is true for the local, uh, the translocal and the transnational. The translocal is not that there aren't instances of transnational organizing, as I suggested, even within the March process, which was primarily a translocal process. In closing, I want to suggest that thinking fields and assemblages might help us get beyond tired sociological debates about the cyclical ebb and flow, rise and decline of protests and social movements, whether local, national, translocal, or, or transnational. Enabling alternative reimagining, uh, 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 an alternative reimagining that may assuage endless activist hand-wringing about the state of the movement. Um, is it dead or alive, peaking, receding, in abeyance, institutionalized, co-opted, autonomous, subversive, effective, successful, ineffectual, disastrous, etc. Such questions, both activist and academic ones, are based on a certain objectification or thingification of social movements. Uh, their shared analytical point of departure this, is that we already know what movements are, what they look like, how to spot one when we see one, and that we even know where we'll find them. Typically, the answer is that we'll find them in the streets protesting, right? All of these classic questions assume that social movements constitute pre-given, predefined totalities that can readily be identified and demarcated empirically, and that social movements are discrete objects, clearly situated and anchored in, t in space and time. Both the notion of discursive fields of action and activist assemblages, I've tried to suggest, moves beyond, move us beyond these questions to pose different ones, prompting us to jettison 
the taken for grantedness of mainstream social movement studies and to pursue alternative means and methods for tracing and tracking social materiality, territorializations and deterritorializations, internal and external topographies of activism, participation and protest. So how uh, are you mobilizing the concept of social movement? How are you grappling with the problem of the global in relation to the post-2010 assemblages or pre-existing movement assemblages? Is assemblage thinking more useful as a concept, an analytic, or an approach to an uh, empirical study, or as a thoroughgoing ontology. From an anti-colonial, indigenous, anti-racist, or feminist perspective, what are the politics of knowledge in engaging assemblage thinking? Be beyond their observable commonalities and linkages, should the post-2010 movement episodes be considered an assemblage in any deeper way? Should transnational feminist, indigenous, or global justice networks be considered an assemblage in any deeper way? How does assemblage thinking enable us to think about power and change, or does it? and on a global scale. Is assemblage thinking self-sufficient in terms of thinking about power and change? How should it be supplemented with other critical traditions? Does assemblage thinking, or how does assemblage thinking, assist in attributing meaning to these movement ensembles and their relation? and or in reading the contemporary global conjuncture. So obviously it's a set of questions about assemblage thinking, about its utility, about how we can use it, and also about should we use it, okay? And especially in light of uh, decolonial, anti-racist and indigenous thought, and also feminist thought. Um, it strikes me that um, this, notion of constellations of co-resistance is something that we might work on. Um, it strikes me that it's a different way of talking about social movements and that it's something in between. It's something akin to my discursive fields of action, but the fact that it, it, it replaces resistance for action uh, in, a, in a way um, is very appealing to me. Um, and I think it might be something somewhat different, and I think one of the things we have to struggle with in this session and beyond is still what assemblage thinking is. Um, and if we want to talk about mo global movement assemblages, I'm of the mind that assemblages are um, more akin to, uh, it was something Rinaldo just said, eruptions, was that? Eruptions. eruptions that, yeah, that assemblages would be more akin to eruptions that then settle back into something else, um, but that, that, uh, that, const that constellations of co-resistance are more permanent articulations, not that, you know, that assemble and reassemble as well, but that are more broad-based than what we normally think of as social movement organizations. Um, that include individuals, that include communities, that include all kinds of actors that we don't normally associate as activists. And, you know, I do think we have to have a time frame. I, while I agree that everything didn't begin in 2010 um, or 2011, um, that, you know, we can't possibly talk about um, transnational, translocal movements across time other than to say that there, these, there are firm historical foundations upon which some of these um, activist modalities um, are, are, are grounded, such as uh, black, black struggles and indigenous people struggles and other struggles, that they didn't, of course, start then. But, you know, I, I also think that there's something distinctive. I think th that even um, 
the way in which BLM has organized, at least in the United States, grows out of the movements of the 2010s. That is to say, the ways in which they've organized around occupations and roadblocks and other kinds of things has to do with, of course, the radical tradition coming from civil rights and black power movements, but also very immediately with what was going on in terms of urban constellations of co-resistance in the, in the 1910s. That you know that 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 Charles Charles Tilly and people would call a repertoire of collective action. I hate that term, but the idea is that there were certain ways of of doing politics that became uh, sort of possible again or imaginable again um, in 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 so it's radical street politics in massive. Form. I mean, street politics have, have never ceased to exist. Sometimes people don't see it because they're not looking for it. But massive, the way that massive street politics is happening around the world is part of what is going on. Why, why 2010 is a, is, a, is a marker of sorts. At least deeply troubled by assemblage <laughs> as a kind of conceptual turn and term. And in part, um, my, my, my trouble is in two areas. Manusha um, um, allowed us to access one area that I think really um, is important, which is that as we think about assemblage, but if we think about transnational feminism and we think about um, women of color feminism of uh, the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the, one of the things that assemblage thinking doesn't do is historically locate the critique of the state that these women had. These women were very, 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 very clear about a critique of the state that somehow in the 90s went missing into the early 2000s. And, and I think for me, there's a struggle between two kinds of things. One is the ways in which the academy has framed how we talk and think about various forms of activism and the ways in which that becomes um, mobilized into subfields and disciplines and you know new formations like social justice and equity studies and these kinds of things that I think works to um, erase the other ways in which these things might trade in traffic. You know, I mean, many of those women might not have been full-time professors, but many of them taught in universities, <laughs> and many of them worked in immigrant you know, organizing and so on. So I'm thinking even about, you know, things like um, immigrant women's centers in Toronto where, you know, a writer like Dion Brand worked or Makeda Silvera, these people showed up in universities, they, showed, they left universities, they came back, you know, and they become a part of these constellations of what we call transnational feminism, women of color feminism, so on. But it was always of a kind of critique of the state as well as a critique intra-community, right? Because often they responded to what we now call interpersonal violence, but also responded to state violences around questions of deportation, labor, and so on and so forth. So there's that piece, and I think that that, that piece is really important when we go back and we map the kinds of literatures that, that Manisha opened us up to, that you see this profound critique of the state. Then the second, the second way in which I'm really resistant to assemblage thinking is the way that I think it comes back to these kinds of communities. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the figure here I'm thinking of is Jasper Puwar's news and taking up of the term through her engagements with, um, with Deleuze and Guattari and, and, and for me, I mean, in the 90s when I was doing my graduate work, I, I worked with the, the Luz and Guattari a lot, but then I was working with questions of the rhizome and schizophrenia, and the question of culture, this kind of schizophrenic zone for the diaspora subject, and the rhizome as, in some ways, analogous to diaspora, around questions of roots, but not clear where they might lead, and so on and so forth. But I think in Chatsbury's work, the attempt to, at first, offer 
assemblage as a counter to intersectionality, and then on the tremendous critique from black feminists, offering it as a supplement and the revision as a supplement, really opened up that space between um, the, the, the first thing that I said and the second thing, which is that Jasper actually failed to acknowledge that those women were offering a critique of the state as well. And I think it's that blind spot in her work that makes me really uncomfortable with assemblage. Because I think that what we, I think part of what we have to do, and you see this, and you see this in the movements. Like if you look at what the young, what the young women in in BLM movements who they will reference, they are actually those women from the from from the 60s, 70s, and 80s um, that they're referencing. Um, those women that did that critique of the states that gave us the language of borderlands, glory, and so forth. It, those are the people that are the backbone that activists on the streets now are reading and engaging with. They're not reading the losing guitar. Um, so there's something in how we shift from, let, let, let me put it in this vernacular, from the street to the academy that I think we need to be a little bit more um, cautious about. But I think we also have to kind of recognize that the street has always been in the academy and the other way around. You know, most of the, again, the young women who are leading these movements are, some of them are undergraduate students, some of them are our graduate students, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, there's the, the, the break that our study seems to want to insist on doesn't, to use this language, doesn't actually exist. So I think that the part of the problem is uh, it's not a problem, so a sandwich theory is a large literature right now, but what I do is basically like I just return to those Gattari themselves. So I think the problem comes from the fact that we don't have this very structural reading of those Gattari themselves. So maybe what you say, I don't know like her work, but when I go, when I listen to that, for instance, and I, I think I see in those Gattari a very historical and also a very genealogical approach and the way that you can also look at history in a different way. And like history with the double uh, hush, which is like goes back to memory and like there's a whole discussion about this. And also state, the critic of state is always there. Like the war machines against the state apparatus. So like there's this whole constellation, but when we just pick up one concept without like considering all the others, things get a little bit like, I don't know, like, uh, difficult to grasp. So for me, like for instance, like I just try to use the like the, the body of the Los Gattari, not only the uh, agencement, uh, also with respect to the concept of body. And also I think like the for them everything is an assemblage. So it is not like uh, assemblage is not just like a certain way of uh, assembling things, so everything, a book is an assemblage, so that, that's the way they discuss it, everything. It's just the differences, I see, that the, like the intensity of the body without, I mean, there's no poor body without organs, and it's also a body in itself, an assemblage. So the differences, the way that it's close to the deterritorialization, and the way it is more close to the re-territorialization scheme, so like the more grounded movements are more re-territorialized movements. But even in them, there are movements of like a larger or more greater uh, deterritorialization. That's the way I see like the more like Gezi type movements are just the movements when we have a blow. But on the other hand, they are also a part of the larger assemblage, which is also historical, a part of a genealogy. So we can also have a look at like what happened before and its impact on the assemblage itself. And that's, what, that's the importance of rituality, for instance, like the openness of the assemblage to novelty comes from its relationship with the virtue and poor past is also a ritual. So what happened before the genealogy and the intergenerational relationships already play a part in it. And also like with respect to feminism, also what I try to do basically more or less is to have a look at the feminist readings of the Rose Gattari, like Moria Gatons, like the way they see body, how they conceptualize body, Rosie Boydotti, with relation to the critic of humanity, humanism. So there is also a way to see and to look at the whole work of the Rose Gattari, not only like picking up the assemblage itself, but also 
with relation to what they say about like the politics and also about power, another question, like their relation with Foucault, for instance, is quite interesting. What they say in A Thousand Plato is that we agree with Foucault on basically everything. Just, there's just one thing is for us, assemblage presets the power. So it is what constitutes the constellations of power. So like the, the, that's the only difference we have with Foucault. And also his work with Foucault is more or less about like what they understand from power and how they conceptualize it. So like just the solution might be just to look at their work in general, not just this concept. I'm thinking about this gathering in light of my experience at World Social Forums, at most of the major, the big international ones, plus a few local ones. And the impression in, the, in a World Social Forum, especially of the sort of global variety, not so much the, this last one in Montreal, but the previous ones, is that you encounter up in one place thousands of groups organizing thousands of workshops on thousands of topics and themes, drawing on their experience in particular contexts around the world. Now, no single forum really includes everybody, but the, the, the traveling of the forum from Brazil to Africa, and actually four different forums were, were held in Africa, to Mumbai, et cetera, has, has been unbelievably enriching and challenging. From the point of view of any particular language, or tradition of thinking of any kind, critical or otherwise, the form is mostly confusing. No discourse can incorporate, can include this variety of difference. But there's a lot of connecting among the different participants at, at, on smaller scales. The ones who organize around water, for example, they find all kinds of points of contact or anti-racism struggles, or gender issues and debates, or queer issues, or the whole list. Uh, so there's lots of, of more local or in particular kinds of rationality, meaning, but that doesn't translate up to a, a single overarching view of the whole. So I'm wondering if maybe this is, is, is symbolic of, of a stage in our history as, as a species on the planet uh, where we are uh, reaching out to one another on scales that were previously unimaginable. We're making partial connections. We're recognizing the limitations of our particular perspectives and frameworks and discourses and, and reaching and, 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 and also reaching beyond. If, 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 that's, if something like that is happening, then assemblage may be useful for capturing the dimension of, dis, of being disconcerted and confused and being, having a sense of partiality and limitation in our own perspectives. But it will miss the larger picture, or what may be a larger picture, of coming together on a, on a new scales and of finding new ways to collaborate with one another. At least some people are talking about this as a kind of an epistemological revolution. And the, the, some people use the term epistemology or epistemologies, plural, of the South. Uh, this makes a lot of sense to me. And our encounter here uh, echoes this sort of learning experience where we're learning about learning, among other things. Uh, and, but in a way that's not just uh, paralyzing, but also inspiring and carrying us forward. I had the privilege to attend a conference in East London. Um, it was a cultural studies conference called Cultural Studies Now, and it was seemed to be a taking stock of where the field of cultural studies has moved over the last 30 years. And the reason why I went is because it was what I would have, I'd never seen Stuart Hall speak, and it was probably going to be one of, or getting close to one of his last public speaking engagements, and he was getting quite sick at that time, and, um, and he was the keynote. And his keynote was uh, like an hour finger wag <laughs> at the state of the field. And he made a couple of jabs at kind of the like theory for theory's sake and in the rafters. And he was like, 
we've moved from, and he was also like kind of propping up his own work and the work of early Birmingham school and stuff like that as being kind of grounded in class struggle and anti-racist struggle and all that sort of stuff. But he said that the move in kind of contemporary cultural studies um, from Gramsci to Deleuze and Guattari was a real problematic one for him because it wasn't the Deleuze and Guattari that were militant communists in the kind of class struggle of 1968. It was this this totally removed sort of theorizing from actual um, class struggle, struggle of people on the ground. So this is just echoing some of the concerns, the way in which theoretical frameworks can travel and be appropriated, not towards more radical ends, but kind of more navel-gazing, um, 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 reactionary sort of ends. But when I think about whether or not assemblage is, is useful for, say, decolonial struggles, I tend to think of the way in which Leanne frames um, the use of, or like, in, like the use of critical frameworks in general. Um, in one way, I think there's always two questions at play: is like, does this provide us as scholars or as activists or whatever a better grasp or empirical sort of representation of what what's happening in reality? Um, and I think, to a certain extent, maybe assemblage theory is kind of useful. Um, in that way, as opposed to other more totalizing, um, kind of um, um, less hetero, like l like just uh, models that don't kind of get at the complexity of our interactions and our movements and so on. Um, but there's always also, I think, a normative question that's being asked is like, does this representation of reality, is it better in that it enables the construction of free worlds or lives in the, in the sense that Ronaldo speaks of? And that, I don't think that assemblage theory for indigenous peoples is all that useful um, because that is a project of theoretical but also cultural self-emancipation. Those worlds are going to be constructed through your own engagements with your own uh, rich traditions and the way in which they've kind of cross-percolated with others. But it's going to be one that is, that is homegrown. So I think that assemblage theory is probably useful in that it, pr it provides, I guess, a different take on reality that, that avoids some of the, the shortcomings of other um, critical frameworks. But in terms of the normative kind of prescriptive element, in terms of the creation of new and free worlds, that is probably going to be left up to the, um, to the communities themselves and, and in critical engagement internally with their own traditions and their relationship with others. Yeah, yeah and just, I mean, just to clarify, um, the, um, I don't, I personally don't have any stake in our uh, embrace or not of assemblage theory. I think that there's been uh, ample uh, examples of how people have used it very selectively and productively without uh, uh, signing on to it to the exclusion of other things. So uh, just to say that, you know, there's no, uh, there's no agenda here to, to uh, want to promote it. It really was a strategy to try to crack open the fossilization of most ways of talking about social movements. I mean, so for those of us who are more anchored in that sort of uh, academic work, the available ways of talking about movements are so problematic that this signals a desire to complicate that. And so it's just, really for me, it was a strategy to do that. And, um, and I think it succeeded actually. <laughs> so I'm happy about that. But, it, but it's also a, a question in terms of uh, how and if, um, and actually I do think there are some people in the room for whom uh, assemblage thinking uh, has been very, very productive in reading particular episodes. And so I don't think there's any question about the utility of that, you know? I think there, there's a larger question about how we might, and how and if we might um, gather uh, the range of work that's in the room in uh, a way that, that both, um, that might provoke, uh, the, the assemblage thinking is just a starting point to ask a larger set of questions.